So, hello community, and thank you for joining. My name is Volodymyr. I am iOS developer here at SoftServe, and today I'm going to talk about Apple's own silicon for the Mac, slash iPad from recent time, the M1 chip. But before we start, maybe a quick show of hands, or it is better to say quick show of pluses in the comments, like who already have a possibility to try out some Mac with M1? Please put the plus sign in the comment section. I'm just curious to know how many of you had this experience. Okay, so first of all, let's check our agenda. So I will begin with some Apple's history so that we can understand how Apple got to this point. Then I will give some overview of M1 itself. And finally, I will conduct a demo of an app that thanks to M1 is able to run on both platforms iOS and macOS without any code change. So let's start. Okay, so there was a big announcement a year ago on WWDC 2020, a new custom silicon. As Tim Cook stated, it was the huge leap forward for the Mac. And to reveal the reason of this announcement, let's dive into some history. As we all know, Apple, as a company, started its journey with a personal computer's production back in 1976. I believe one of its most recognizable lines for all of us is the Macintosh, or simply the Mac, since 1998. At that time, Apple was manufacturing only their devices, not components they used for them. Only the parts were supplied by their vendors, including the CPU. Before the M1, Apple had already done two transitions of the chips for the Macintosh. So the first one was from Motorola to PowerPC chip in 1994, and the second was from PowerPC to Intel chip in 2005-2006. And let's talk about these transitions a little bit, because it is where everything starts. So the first chip, Motorola 68000 series, was from a family of 32-bit microprocessors and was based on a complex instruction set computing, also known as CISC. Basically, CISC is a type of microprocessor design in which single instruction can execute several low-level operations, such as load from a memory and an arithmetic operation and store to a memory at once. The primary goal of CISC architecture is to complete a task in as few lines of assembly code as possible, though, the design was intended to compute complex instructions in the most efficient way, it was later found that many small, short instructions could compute complex instructions more efficiently. And this actually led to a design called reduced instruction set computing, aka RISC, which, by the way, was used in PowerPC chips. So PowerPC stands for performance optimization with enhanced risk performance computing. And it is a risk instruction set architecture created in 1991 by the Apple, IBM, and Motorola Alliance, known as AIM. And I guess I have seen this somewhere. Nevertheless, the reason why Apple moved to PowerPC is that it had already realized its limitations and risks of dependency upon a single CPU vendor at a time when Motorola was failing on the delivering of some of the chips. Also, by that time, Apple had already accomplished its own research, which convinced the leadership that the future of computing was in the risk methodology. And on that occasion, IBM offered Apple to collaborate and create a family of chips based on the power architecture. As Apple was one of the largest customers of Motorola, it was asked to join the discussion because it had more experience with manufacturing high volume microprocessors than IBM. So the alliance was created and Apple moved with PowerPC chips in Macs up until 2005. But at the end of that time, Apple's PowerPC collaboration with IBM and Motorola wasn't going so well. In fact, their chips was failing behind Intel's, which used CISC architecture. Intel-based processors outperformed PowerPC processors in terms of energy consumption by almost five times. 
And on WWDC in 2005, Steve Jobs stated that if Apple continued to rely on PowerPC technology, it would be enabled to build future Macs it envisioned. And after that, transition to Intel began and took two years. Before moving to the last transition, it is important to consider chips of other product lines that Cupertino company produced. And I'm talking about iPhones and iPads. So the original iPhone was launched in 2007 and used ARM-based chip produced by Samsung. In 2008, Apple would sign an architectural license with ARM to design their own chips from the ground up. In 2009, Apple would buy a processor company PA Sammy. This actually was a key strategic move for Apple as it gave them the expertise and potential to design some of the best ARM chips. In 2012, Apple released their first chip with fully custom designed CPU, the A6, and it was used in the iPhone 5. Despite being the first fully custom generation chip, it had an impressive performance, two times faster than the previous chip. Then with A7 in 2014, they made the leap to the 64-bit, not just with more modern instruction set, but with the whole new targeted architecture that would let them start scaling up for the future. Apple would call that chip design a desktop class architecture. A little hint for the future, right? And since then, Apple kept on improving the A series each year by moving to the higher performance and higher efficiency. An interesting thing, here is the chart which shows an evolution of Apple's and Intel's chip performance in comparison to each other. And you can observe here the minor improvement of Intel and rapid improvement of Apple. If you take a closer look, we can see that Intel's i9-10900K desktop chip, which consumes 125 watts of power, has less performance than Apple's A14 chip which consumes only five watts of power. That's total fatality. And basically, that is the reason why on WWDC 2020, Tim Cook announced the third transition, transition to the M1, with the very similar words. Okay, so moving on to the M1 itself. Yep, big announce, wake up call to the whole industry, diverse reactions of users, but what makes it so special? Why it is so fast? What technologies does it use? Let's investigate. So first of all, it is not a standard ARM CPU. The Apple M1 is SOC or system on a chip. All we know that usually a computer has multiple different parts, each of which executes a particular job. And those chips cooperate together to perform certain kinds of tasks. In case of M1, it combines all of that chips on a single silicon package. It does have a CPU, it has eight cores, and these cores are divided into two parts. Four high performance cores, the Firestorm, and four high efficiency cores, the iStorm. The high performance cores are designed to offer the best performance for power intensive single threaded tasks. They can work together to offer impressive multi threaded performance. For less intensive tasks uh, that don't require the same power, there are four high efficiency cores that use tens of the power to preserve a battery life. Apple states that these cores offer performance similar to the dual core MacBook Air, but at much lower power. These cores can work alone when significant power isn't needed, but for demanding tasks, all eight cores can be engaged at once. And on Geekbench browser, we can find some benchmark scores of M1 CPU compared to the CPU of other Macs. And it turns out that the highest performing Mac is Mac Mini. It earned a single core score of 1,701 and multi-core score of 7,373 with MacBook Pro and MacBook Air coming just behind. And one of the reasons of such results is the usage of increased parallel processing capabilities of the chip. More precisely, 
at the M1 Firestorm cores use something called out of order execution. It allows processor to execute instructions in an order governed by the availability of input data and execution units rather than by their original order in a program. And thanks to this, the processor can avoid being idle while waiting for the preceding instructions to complete. Instead, it can process the next instructions that are able to run immediately and independently. So for high level example, uh, let's imagine that these next instructions were loaded to the register for execution. And also let's assume that multiplication and division take some time, about three clock cycles. And addition with subtractions take only one cycle. So in order execution, we'll start with the first instruction. And as it is division, it will take some time. Next instructions won't start until it finishes. So when the first instruction is done, all other instructions will be executed sequentially, one after another. Out of order execution will also start from the first instruction. And during its processing, it will check next operations on availability and independency. So the second instruction will have to wait on the result of the first one because it used the first registered cell in which the first instruction will write its result. But the third instruction doesn't rely on any of previous ones. So it will be started also in parallel to this first one. And as the third instruction has add operation, it will be processed quickly. And right after this, the first instruction will start its execution and so on until the last instruction because it relies on the result of the second one and the second one relies on the first one, which is about to be finished. And another reason of why M1 has such a great performance and efficiency is that it uses hospitalized chips, which are very good at doing a particular tasks. So whereas a general purpose CPU and core needs to be able to handle many of different tasks, these specialized processors are built to handle just a few. So each time when a system can offload processing to these specialized processors, it means just less work for the CPU. And there are many of those specialized processors. For example, an image signal processor or ISP that increases the image processing capabilities of the M1 chip. A video coder and decoder which handles efficient conversion of video files to a different formats. In addition to this, it also has an Apple Neural Engine or ANE for tasks like voice recognition, camera processing, etc. The secure enclave, uh, which handles tasks with encryption, authentication, and security. And the unified memory that allows all of these cores along with the CPU and GPU to access the same fast memory. The last one actually takes a dramatic role in the speed increase because there is no need to copy chunks of data between, for example, CPU and GPU. Okay, so now let's review a GPU. It also has eight cores and like their CPU cores, Apple has been developing their own GPU technology. With it, Apple states that they get best of both worlds an incredible performance and low power. Apple states that they get uh, the capabilities of that chip, uh, it's next. For example, it is able to run almost 25,000 threads simultaneously with the 2.6 teraflops of throughput. And according to Apple, the M1 has the fastest integrated graphics in a personal computer. So let's see some benchmark scores. Here you can see that Apple's integrated GPU beats some of the mid-range discrete graphic cards, which is kind of impressive. And the coolest thing is that M1 is the first chip in its generation, meaning that it will be the worst chip of its kind. Next generation should bring us more performance slash efficiency. Well, possibly we will see something new on the next week. Hopefully. Okay, so moving on to the demo app. But before I start, I need to notice that our team had a chance to procure Mac Mini with M1. 
And we have established it in the office so that each team member was able to connect to it remotely. Uh, that means if you see some graphic glitches, this will be because of my network connection. So I'm sorry in advance. So let's jump to the Mac. Yep. And here it is. Let's see about this Mac. Yes, yeah, so we are running on a big Sur. And this is indeed M1. So I didn't lie. OK, so here is the source code of the demo app. Uh, basically, let, let's run it to see what it can do. Where are you? Yeah. So basically, this application is able to present some information about specific iPhone, uh, specific Apple device. For example, on initial screen, uh, we have a list of some of device types of the Apple company, yeah? For example, iPhones, iPads, and MacBooks. So if we choose some particular device type, for example, iPhones, we will get a list of models of that particular type. And if we will get some, if we will choose some concrete model, for example, iPhone 12 Pro, we will get some information about that model. For example, the icon, some description, and here we have a specs button, which will present us an alert with some technical information about that device. So also I can do the same with the iPads and MacBooks as well. Also, I need to notice that the first screen was written with the UI kit and all other screens like this one and this were written with the Swift UI. And also right now you can notice that I'm running this application on the iPhone simulator, but let's try to run it on the Mac itself. And for this, I just need to go to the Xcode and change my target from the iPhone simulator to MacBook. I guess I need to hide the video kind of. Yes, so we can choose only the Mac and hit the run button. Yes, so this build has succeeded. And here it is, my iOS app on the Mac OS without any code change, just out of the box. Okay, so let's open also on the iPhone just to compare. So basically on iPhone, I was able to scroll the list. Also, I can do this on the Mac application. I can choose some particular device type and I can get some information about specific model. And also I can click the specs button here. On the macOS, we will get some native uh, alert for this platform. And as you can see, everything is responsive. Everything works as expected. Here I also can, uh, resize the way the window, come on. I also can make it full screen and do the same things. So it, I will get some information about the devices. So actually that's, that's pretty cool. And this is done thanks to two things. The first one is the same architecture, the ARM architecture on which the iPhone chips and right now the M1 are running, yeah? And the second, second thing is that the Big Sur, in this case, it uses the same approaches and frameworks as it uses when it runs some iOS app on the macOS with Mac Catalyst, but with one difference. Uh, with the Apple Silicon approach, it doesn't recompile your iOS binary for the macOS platform specifically. It just uses the same binary as on, on iOS. So basically, if you are okay with the look of your iOS app on the macOS with the Apple Silicon, yeah? And if you don't need some deep customization, 
you can choose this approach. But if you want to have some customizable features of your iOS app on the macOS, you should probably use the Mac Catalyst. Actually, Apple recommends this. So um, basically, that's it from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions or comments, please, you're welcome. Hi.